So here we are at lecture number 13 and today I would like to stress that all, most chemical reactions actually they proceed stepwise. They are not just forming A to B but there's A that reacts to B and B reacts to C until the molecule reaches its lowest energy state. Right? So most chemical reactions are stepwise. What we looked at before was always like a single step. So keep this in mind and um, here's an example. So here a nucleophilic um, attack by those, this hydroxide ion to this acyl chloride. So it proceeds via two steps. First, it forms this intermediate, abbreviated with an I, where um, the chlor is still attached, but the hydroxide has now attached. And then in step two, the chlor actually, um, the bond is broken and the chlor is being released as a negative ion and uh, we reform these pi bonds uh, here between the carbon and the oxygen. So in the, in the energy versus reaction coordinate diagram, we start at the low energy of the reactants and then we overcome the activation energy for the step one to produce this intermediate. Right? So now in order to proceed for this intermediate to go to the final product, we have to overcome a second activation energy that results in the products. So this is very typical. Look, most chemical reactions are actually behaving this way. And um, I want to highlight or stress here that this intermediate is not a transition state, right? So intermediates, it's, it's not the same. Intermediates, they are actually stable for a certain amount of time. So you can really analyze your um, reaction mixture and you can find these intermediate molecules uh, by uh, spectroscopy or by chromatography, while these transition states, they are just hypothetical states. They don't really, um, we don't really know what these transition states are because we can't measure them. They, they are so short lived that like immediately as the activation energy is uh, overcome, they, f they disappear to, to form products. So, so intermediates are really existing states of um, chemical reactions that proceed stepwise. So again here we have this case um, where we are um, f overcoming the activation energy for the first step and then the activation energy for the second step here is, um, is smaller. So imagine what that means. So that means um, if you overcome this step, you form these intermediates. Now for the intermediates, it's actually easier to form products than to go back to the reactant, right? So like, right, it's an, in, it's an equilibrium process, right? There's a dynamic equilibrium. There's a forward reaction and there's a backward reaction. So in this case, um, the, the, as soon as you form the intermediate, most of the intermediates will actually f make it to become products. So what we say in this case is that the reaction is really only um, um, depending on overcoming the first activation energy. So we call this the rate determining step because it has the higher activation energy. So since the, pro the intermediates, most of them overcome, like as soon as they are formed, they will actually form products rather than going back to reactants. So step one is the rate determining step. So here um, you still have a higher activation energy for the, for the reactants to intermediate, um, but the activation energy of going back to the reactants from the in intermediate is, is lower this time. So if the energy uh, profile has this shape, then the rate determining step is going from the intermediate to the product, right? So step two is the rate determining step because you have many of your intermediates that are formed, they actually go back to the reactant. So only really overcoming the second energy barrier is what controls how much product you form at the end. So the equilibrium, uh, the, the rate constant for the second step is, is the dominant uh, one to determine the rate equation now. So let's look in, at an example. So the example is oxidation of methanoic acid with bromine. So here's the methanoic acid, the bromine, and also water. The oxidation product is carbon dioxide, um, two bromine anions, and two hydronium ions, protonated waters. So you could now speculate. Good. So this has 
three reactants. Um, and so we can set up a rate uh, equation, a rate law for this, for the reaction rate. So probably um, it will be proportional to the concentration of the methanoic acid, the concentration of the bromine, and the concentration of the water to the power two. Um, um, however, actually water is used as the solvent, um, so there's plenty of water. So the water is, is not really a concentration limited component, so you can neglect this um, concentration in the rate law. So the, con the rate law will probably just be um, the concentration of the methanoic acid times the concentration of the bromine, both first order um, times the rate constant. But what experiments show is that the rate law looks like this. Right? The consumption of the um, uh, bromine follows this law where you have indeed the concentration of the bromine and the concentration of the methanoic acid. However, in the denominator, there is a concentration of the hydronium ions, the products. Hmm, it's strange. That doesn't look like how we would have usually set up the, the, the rate equation, right? So what you can see for this reaction, the concentration of hydronium ions is actually negatively affecting the, the rate. So the higher the concentration of the hydronium, the lower the, the rate will be, right? So it's inhibiting the reaction. But nevertheless, how does this interesting rate law uh, uh, come together? Like it's an experimental um, observation. Let's see if we can understand it. So um, here is um, uh, the table I showed you before in our acid base lecture, um, acid base equilibrium. So for methanoic acid, this uh, molecule, right, we find that the equilibrium acid dissociation constant is uh, 1.8 times 10 to the negative 4. So remember, it has it's a weak acid, so um, most of it is actually in its uh, neutral form. So it has a pK value of 3.75. And remember what this means. The pKa value is the pH value at which 50% of your acid is dissociated. So below the P, this pH value, below the pKa value, most of the acid is in its neutral form, right? It's protonated, while above the pH um, here, it's in its dissociated form. So that practically means that with increasing hydronium ion concentration, we have a lower pH value, and more of this here will be in its neutral form, right? More methanoic acid will be protonated. So at low pH value, you have a high concentration of hydronium ions, and as a consequence, you get the neutral um, methanoic acid. But at low concentrations of the hydronium ions, you have a high pH value and you predominantly get the negatively charged acid or the conjugate base. So, and with this, we can actually form a hypothesis now. Hmm, if the hydronium ion concentration has a negative effect on the reaction rate, so maybe it is not that the um, neutral methanoic acid reacts with the bromine and the water, but actually it's the, the dissociated, the conjugate base that reacts with the bromine, right? Because at low uh, p hydronium ion concentrations, we have a high reaction rate. That means at high pH values. Okay, so hypothesis. So hypothesis is the bromine oxidizes the negatively charged methanoic acid. Good. And we, we derived this hypothesis based of, of this experimentally observed rate law. Okay, so if that's the case, then the reaction rate uh, or the reaction equation would look like this here. So negatively charged acid plus bromine gives the products. Good. So in this case, we must have this preceding reaction, the dissociation of the methanoic acid with the um, base, the water in this case. So acid reacts to conjugate base and um, conjugates acid. So this is now a preceding reaction. So right, I'm trying to describe this, this reaction as a stepwise process now. So in, 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 in this uh, acid base equilibrium, we can define the acid base equilibrium constant, the, the Ka value, right? And it's simply the, the products, the hydronium ions and the dissociated acid 
divided by the um, methanoic acid and the, the water we can leave out because it's uh, at a constant concentration because it's the solvent. So now acid base equilibrium means there's a forward reaction again from the neutral acid to the dissociated acid. K1 is our rate constant and the backward reaction we can define as K2. So as we learned in our last uh, lecture, equilibrium is the ratio of the forward reaction constant and the uh, reverse reaction constant, K1 over K2. So this is the Ka value now for this example. So we rearrange now this expression for the acid constant um, for the concentration of the negatively charged um, methanoic acid, right? So just um, multiply Ka with the concentration on the denominator here and divide with the um, hydronium ion concentration. So now we have an expression. And now let's look at our actual reaction. Right? This looks like a second order reaction. So we can um, write a rate constant K3 for this. So K1, K2, and that's the, the step uh, to form the products, K3. So let's uh, say this is um, the, the, the regular one. This is a single step reaction. And it's also called an elementary reaction where just the concentration of the reactant, the negatively charged acid, and the concentration of the other reactant, bromine, times the rate constant K3. Okay, but now we have already this expression for the um, negatively charged acid, depending on the acid con equilibrium constant. And plugging this in here for the acid concentration, the negative acid concentration gives us this expression. And if you combine this acid dissociation constant with the K3, you get an effective rate constant now. And look at the expression that you get here. This was experimentally determined. This is what we determined with our theory, right? So the two of them are identical. So now by actually analyzing the process, we, we, we understood the mechanism of this reaction, right? We, we determined what stepwise uh, procedure it, it, it goes. So, and it's based on an effective um, rate constant that is a combination of the acid base equilibrium and the a step uh, for the formation of the products. Right? It's interesting. So you see now the reaction kinetics can actually provide you also information about reaction mechanisms. I think that's really amazing. Let me show you something even more amazing. So here, this is a protein molecule, a simulation, a molecular dynamics simulation. And this protein molecule is now from an extended conformation. It's, it is undergoing a uh, a, a folding process and doing this it finds its um, minimum energy during this folding and now it actually unfolds again you can control this with the temperature and it does that also according to such an energy we call this energy landscape now so here it has multiple minima and um, in order for it to find its um, energy minimum it, it needs to go a stepwise process of forming bonds and uh, unforming bonds um, until it reaches a minimum where it is stable. And uh, you, maybe you've heard already, like many, many illnesses, um, like Alzheimer's disease, for instance, they, they are related to an, a wrong folding of the proteins. So the mechanism of this protein folding is, is very much related to what we just discussed. And it can also be understood by studying the rates of, of, of the protein folding, and which is, has very important implications for, for um, medicine, for instance. Okay, so with this, I have some homework for you to do. Um, we are at the end of the chapter number nine, studying reaction rates. And next uh, week, we continue with more um, about uh, reaction mechanisms. Thanks.